Thank you for clicking on the video to the conclusion of Apex Predator Wolf Moon. I wanted to take just a couple of minutes and tell you a few things before we launch into the last few chapters of the book. I want to extend a special thanks to D.A. Roberts for allowing me to narrate his books for this podcast. It has been so much fun. We're planning on doing several more. This is a, this is a brand new thing. No one offers current novels that are coming out on a podcast like this free to the listener. Our theory was that we would do this so that it's free to you. You would have to suffer through a few ads, but it's still free. It's not a $20 purchase or a $15 purchase or a subscription to a company like Audible. But you could listen to it free and let the advertisers pay us instead of you paying us. And I think it's a good model. So the first three books we've done, Odin's Call, Curse of the Wendigo, and now Apex Predator Wolf Moon, have just been a test run to see how this goes. It's doing pretty well. It's, um, it's you know, we're not, nobody's getting rich off of any of this, but we're trying something new. And I wanted to thank you for your responses in the comment section. You guys are the nicest people in the world. And we're going to continue to do this. And I'd like to work deals with other authors to do this as well. Because I love doing these audiobooks. I know there's a portion of the people who listen to Dixie Cryptid who enjoy the longer form audiobooks. And I just think it's a good idea. And it's something different we can do maybe once a month. You know, if I can, if I can have time to get these recorded, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you and uh, let you know how much I appreciate you. I don't get to say that much because I try not to do much talking before these podcasts because it kind of annoys people, but I just felt compelled to tell you that and let you know how much I love you, how much DA appreciates your, your feedback. And he's agreed for me to do some more. So Blood Eagle, the Wild Hunt Blood Eagle will be next. I think I can get to it by next month. Thank you for listening. And now for the conclusion of Apex Predator, Wolf Moon. This podcast may not be suitable for young listeners. Chapter 20, Where There's Smoke When a storm is coming, all other birds seek shelter. The eagle alone avoids a storm by flying above it. So in the storms of life, may your heart be like an eagle's and soar above. Rider Unknown Will peered around the edge of a large boulder. The pale moonlight provided enough illumination to see their quarry. There were twelve of the creatures gathered around the entrance to the cave, and Will saw that one of them was the Alpha. It had survived. The entrance to the cave had been sealed years ago by a large steel grating that had been sunk into the stone surrounding the entrance and anchored with concrete. The Missouri Department of Conservation had said that it was to protect an endangered species of brown cave bat, but Will had his doubts. Will took note that the wind was with them. They were downwind from the dogmen, and that meant it was highly unlikely the dogmen knew they were there. If they were, they gave no sign. Will slowly took in the entire area, looking for more of the creatures. In addition to the twelve creatures, he found the three missing people. They were clearly dead. Three of the beasts approached the grating and grasped it near the top. And with a growling grunt of effort, they started pulling the grate. And in seconds, Will heard the straining of metal and the cracking of rock. The grating came free from the entrance and the dogmen tossed it casually away. It landed with a thud in the snow-covered leaves ten feet from the entrance. Immediately, the creatures began entering the cave. The three that had ripped the grating off each took hold of one of the bodies by the ankle and dragged them inside. The Alpha was last to enter, and just before it did, 
its ears perked up, and it stood to its full height. Sniffing the air, began looking around. Will and the others ducked down, careful not to give away their positions with rapid movement. The Alpha searched the area with its eyes, clearly sensing something. After a few moments of not seeing anything, it let out a short growl and ducked into the cave. That was close, whispered Mika. Do you think it smelled us? I don't think so, replied Will. If it had, it would have called the others for an attack. So what's next? asked Doc. Yeah, did we go in after him? asked Jacob. No, said Will. I have a better idea. There are two other exits from this cave. One is too small for them to go through, and the other comes out on the top of the island. It's sealed off like this one was. They'll have to tear off the grating up there as well. What's your idea? asked Mika. We're going to split up, said Will. One group at each entrance. Once we're all in place, we flush them like a covey of quail. Well, how do we do that? asked Thomas. Under most circumstances, I would say start a fire, said Will. It's too wet with all this snow, said Mika. I don't think fire will work. Why don't we seal the other entrances, said Dot, and then go in this one and back them into the corner. That might work, said Will. The problem is gunfire inside a cave will be so loud that we'll all go deaf. Doc has a suppressor on his rifle, said Mika. I can hang back and cover all of you, said Doc. Pick off any of them that try to run. The rest of us will have to use blades and spears, said Will. I'll go to the other entrance and see if there's anything we can do to seal it, said Jason. I'll go with you, said Mika. Several minutes passed before they returned. Will kept a constant eye on the entrance to the cave, but nothing went in or out. Crouching low, Mika and Jason stopped next to Will so they could speak without going above a whisper. We can't block it, whispered Jason. There isn't anything up there to block it with. Nothing we can lift. Then we're going to have to cover it, said Will. Jason, take four up to the top and cover that entrance. With any luck, you should be able to take them down before they can rip the grating loose. The rest of us will go in this side and try to drive them toward you. Just don't fucking shoot us, said Mika, smiling. No promises, said Jason, laughing. Turning to the others, Jason pointed at Doc, Samuel, Kaylee, and Melissa, motioning for them to follow him. The rest remained hidden as they made their way up the hill to the other entrance. If I recall correctly, said Will, that cave isn't very big inside. I could touch the ceiling when I was in my early teens. Now we should be able to stand up, but the Olonga Doglala won't be able to. They're just too big. Then that just gives us a bit of an advantage, said Mika. How do you want to play this? The first of us through the door need to use the spears, said Will. Everyone else use blades. Don't use a gun unless absolutely necessary. As everyone prepared their weapons, Sarah moved over next to Will. Be careful, she whispered. You too, he replied. Just as they were preparing to move toward the entrance, they heard gunshots ring out from the top of the hill. Go, shouted Will. Pulling their spears, Will moved toward the entrance to the cave as fast as he could. Mika, Jacob, and David drew their spears and joined him. The others drew their tomahawks and long knives and followed right behind them. Just as they were reaching the entrance, two of the dogmen emerged from the darkness, and from the looks on their faces, they weren't expecting anyone to be waiting for them. It was too late for them to react. They were already within spear range. Will drove his spear through the first one's left eye, while Mika buried his spear into the beast's chest, piercing the heart. Jacob and David dropped the blunt end of their spears into the dirt and let the momentum of the second creature impale itself on the outstretched spears. Both of the creatures fell to the ground and didn't stir. Yanking their spears free, they moved into the mouth of the cave and from the depths of the cave they could hear snarling and screams of pain. The gunfire suddenly stopped and they could hear Doc yelling down the hill toward them. 
They're coming your way, he shouted. Setting the spears, they waited for the charge, but it never came. Where the hell are they? asked Mika. I don't know, said Will. There's only so many places they can go inside that cave. Moving farther inside the cave, Will peered into the darkness searching for any signs of movement. Behind him, he heard a hissing pop followed by a bright red light. The sound repeated twice and the hellish red glow behind him grew more intense. Will dug down and allowed whoever had popped the road flares a clear shot at throwing them deep into the cave, and three bright red burning flares sailed into the darkness, suddenly making the interior of the cave look like the gates of hell itself. Although he heard the growls and snarls, he couldn't see any sign of the remaining dogmen. There were the bodies of the three creatures lying motionless at the back of the cave, Off to one side were the badly mutilated bodies of the three missing men. They all showed clear signs of being fed upon. Where the fuck are they? said Mika. There's got to be a branching tunnel. Just the one that leads to the tiny opening, said Will. Want to bet they're going to try to force it open, said Thomas. Let's move, said Will, heading deeper into the cave. Mika stayed right beside him with Jacob and David right behind them. The tunnel was too narrow for them to walk more than two at a time. Once they reached the main cavern, Will glanced up and saw Doc looking down at him. Doc! shouted Will. Watch the south corner of the island. That's the only other entrance. On it! shouted Doc, disappearing. Moving toward the side tunnel that led south, Will kept his spear level. and Mika ignited another flare and threw it down the tunnel as far as he could. It bounced over the rock surface and lit up a larger room less than 20 yards down the tunnel. The eerie red glow cast shadows of two of the creatures. Will could see that they both threw their arms up to block the light from their sensitive eyes. And as they moved cautiously down the tunnel, Will's instincts told him that something was very wrong. Emerging into the room, Will saw two of the creatures on the left side of the tunnel, but no others. The Alpha and one other were missing. Mika and David moved to attack the two creatures to their left while Will searched the flickering shadows for the Alpha. He clearly saw the opening that led outside, but it was barely big enough for a rabbit to pass through. It was clear that they hadn't exited that way. Will, look, said Sarah, pointing. In the far right corner was an area that sunk down another ten feet and at the back of that room was a large pool of water. He saw the Alpha standing near the water's edge. It turned and snarled at him before diving into the water and disappearing. The other creature followed suit. Will sprinted toward the pool of water, dropping equipment as he ran. He dropped his armor and most of his weapons, leaving only his two knives, a tomahawk, and his Hellcat X2 9mm. Behind him, he heard Mika yell, There's more coming from the side passage. The Alpha's running, Will yelled back. Go after the Alpha, said Mika. We'll take care of the rest. Without hesitation, Will dove into the dark water, and behind him, he heard another splash as he was diving into the depths of the pool. There was just enough illumination to reveal a tunnel leading off into the darkness. And using the wall as a guide, Will started swimming after the escaping Alpha. The water was too murky for him to see who had dove into the water behind him, and it was too late to stop them. Whoever it was grasped his belt and swam along behind him. Will continued to swim as hard as he could. He was beginning to feel lightheaded and his lungs were on fire. His body was desperately willing him to take a breath, but he knew that meant drowning. And kicking as hard as he could, he pushed deeper into the tunnel. Whoever it was that followed him held on tightly to his belt. And just when he thought he was going to pass out, he saw the light above him. He kicked to the surface and he emerged into fresh air. He was in the lake near the edge of the cliff where the large spring emptied into it. 
He gulped a huge amount of air, and Will felt relief wash over him. Next to him, Sarah emerged from the water and began gasping for air as well. The water was ice cold, probably close to the freezing point. In fact, if it wasn't for the spring making the water move constantly, it would have likely been frozen over. The sun was turning the sky above him a dark shade of crimson. However, they could not see the sun itself since they were in the shadow of the cliff face. Where did they go? asked Sarah, her teeth starting to chatter from the cold. Will could see the Alpha and the remaining member of the pack racing down the trail toward the wooden staircase that climbed the side of the bluff leading up to the ruins of the castle. Will and Sarah swam toward the shore, and by the time they got out of the water, both were shaking and their lips were turning blue. We, we've got to get warm, said Sarah through chattering teeth. Will nodded in agreement and helped her out onto the bank. I'm going after the Alpha, he said. Can you make it to the truck? I, I, I'm going with you, she said stubbornly. Will knew that there would be no arguing with her. He also knew that the coal would likely kill them both if they didn't find a way to get warm. Chapter 21 Storming the Castle When you know who you are, when your mission is clear and you burn with the inner fire of unbreakable will, no cold can touch your heart and no deluge can dampen your purpose. You know that you are alive. Chief Seattle Duwamish, 1780-1866 We've got to run if we want to live, said Will. He took Sarah by the arm and pulled her along with him. The cold was already beginning to affect them both. Will could feel his hair starting to freeze, and although running would cause intense pain, it was the only way to get their core temperatures back up and keep them alive. It also allowed them to pursue the Alpha. Sarah stumbled a few times but kept going. There was a grimace of pain on her face, but she never cried out. By the time that they reached the bottom of the wooden staircase, they were starting to feel their temperatures rise. Don't stop, said Will, forcing himself not to shiver or chatter his teeth. Push through it. Although the stairs were covered in snow, their moccasins gave them a solid grip and kept them from slipping. Will remembered that there were over 300 steps leading to the top of the bluff. If they kept up that pace, then they should be warm enough to continue the fight by the time they reached the top. Step by agonizing step, they made their way up the bluff. When they finally reached the top, they could see the tracks from the two dogmen leading up the path toward the ruins of the castle. How much farther? asked Sarah her teeth no longer chattering. Will glanced at her and he could see steam rising from her hair. It gave her an ethereal quality that made her all the more beautiful. With the crimson sky behind her, she looked like she'd just stepped out of a dream. Not much, he replied. Keep moving. They continued to move rapidly up the trail, following the tracks of the dog men. As the old castle came into view, Will could see the two creatures were stopped on the front steps. The Alpha stood over the other creature, leaning down and examining its leg. It must have been wounded. As Will and Sarah approached it, the Alpha turned and snarled at them. It crouched low, preparing to fight. The second creature got to its feet slowly and began growling. Hurt or not, it was still a dangerous opponent. I've got the Alpha, said Will. Will took his tomahawk in his left hand and his long knife in his right, and Sarah did the same and moved off to his right about ten feet. They would both need room to fight and dodge. As the creatures began cautiously advancing toward them, Will saw the Alpha give the other creature a concerned look. It suddenly struck him that the other creature was a female. It had to be the Alpha female. Whether irony or fate, they had been pitted against their counterparts. In a flash, the Alpha rushed at Will. 
Claws and teeth flashed in the morning light as it came at him with incredible speed. The alpha female did the same, only somewhat slower due to the wound on her left thigh. Blood still oozed from the ragged wound. Will doe to his left, narrowly avoiding the savage slash that was meant to take his head off. The alpha slid on the snow-covered cobblestones, his claws screeching as he tried to stop his momentum. The alpha female dove at Sarah with the intention of burying her to the ground, but Sarah leapt to the side and slashed the creature's left arm with her tomahawk. This brought a howl of pain as the alpha female hit the ground and rolled to a stop. Sarah didn't give the creature time to recover and pressed the attack. With a powerful thrust, she drove the long knife down toward the beast's neck, but at the last moment, it put its arms up to defend itself. The knife sliced into the outstretched arm and punctured completely through the right forearm and embedded in the shoulder. Roaring in pain and fury, it backhanded Sarah with a powerful blow from its left hand. The force of the blow sent Sarah flying, slamming her into the side of a large oak tree. Sarah hit the ground with a grunt of pain. As she struggled to her feet, the alpha female roared in pain as it pulled the knife from her arm and shoulder. Hurling it away, Sarah saw it fly over the edge of the cliff and vanish from sight. The alpha regained its footing and launched another attack at will. This time it came in low and fast, claws outstretched to disembowel him. Slashing out with his tomahawk, Will spun to the left. The tomahawk slashed a deep gouge down the alpha's head from brow to jawbone. Blood flowed freely from the wound and covered the right eye, and it was impossible to tell if the eye was destroyed or not due to the amount of blood. But Will didn't escape unscathed. The Alpha managed a vicious slash along Will's rib cage on the left side, and it dug through the layers of clothing and rending the flesh and scoring the bone, and blood gushed from the four claw marks, turning the snow beneath him a crimson red. The Alpha shook his head, trying to clear his vision. Will knew he was hurt, but he couldn't stop to bind his wounds. There would be time for that after the fight, if he survived. Sarah stood unsteady on her feet. Her left leg was badly injured from the impact with the tree. From the amount of pain, she was sure it was fractured or broken. The pain distracted her for a moment, and the alpha female took full advantage. In a flash, the creature knocked her to the ground, pinning her beneath its weight. Sarah fought back, but the creature was just too strong. She could feel the heat of its breath as it moved in to rip her throat out with its teeth, and she managed to get one arm free and tried to force the beast's head back, but instead it bit into her forearm and she cried out in pain. The tomahawk was still in her other hand, but the arm was pinned down by the beast, and Sarah looked into the evil yellow eyes and knew that she was going to die. Starling, the creature opened its mouth and leaned in closer. No, screamed Will, turning toward her. Taking advantage of this distraction, the big alpha launched itself at Will, and in that instant, Will knew he could save himself or save her. It wasn't a tough decision. With the speed of a striking snake, Will drew his Hellcat X2 and he fired. The bullet struck the she-wolf just behind the left eye, erupting out the other side of the skull in a fountain of crimson gore. The creature was dead before it hit the ground, pinning Sarah down with the sheer weight of the beast. The Alpha drove Will into the ground with enough force to knock the wind out of his lungs. But Will fought back, trying to jam the Hellcat into his ribs, but the weapon failed to cycle another round due to the ice that had built up on it. The Alpha sunk its teeth into Will's left shoulder, looking to rip the arm from the socket, and Will felt the white-hot agony pierce through him. In desperation, he drove his long knife deep into the Alpha's rib cage. Howling in pain, the Alpha let go of Will's shoulder and stood up, 
Awkwardly, it reached for the handle of the blade, trying to yank it free. Will lunged to his feet and drove his fist into the creature's ribs right next to the blade. And roaring in fury, the Alpha released the handle and grabbed Will with both hands. Will tried to break free, but the beast was too strong. Lifting Will effortlessly, it threw him into the stone wall of the castle. The impact nearly knocked him out, and he felt something pop in his left arm. While the Alpha removed the knife, Will forced himself to his feet, and his left arm dangled useless. It was clear that it had been broken in several places. Before the Alpha could press the attack, Sarah launched a fury of blows at the beast with her tomahawk. She was limping badly on her damaged leg, but moved as fast as possible. The Alpha dodged them easily, keeping its distance from her, and the Alpha fainted to the right and then reversed with a lightning-fast backhand that knocked Sarah flying backward and sent her tomahawk flying off into the darkness of the trees. The Alpha charged at her, knowing she was unarmed. "'You killed mine,' hissed the Alpha. "'Now I kill yours.' "'No!' shouted Will, throwing his tomahawk as he ran toward the Alpha. The tomahawk flew fast and true, striking the Alpha in the chest and sinking deep into the muscle and bone beneath. Yanking it free, the Alpha turned and threw it back at Will with incredible force. Will dove forward and rolled through the snow, landing next to his Hellcat X2, and he snatched it up and stuck it against his boot, knocked the ice free from the weapon. Hooking the rear sights on his boot, Will racked the pistol with one hand. Despite the cold and wet conditions, the pistol chambered around and went into battery. Before he could raise his pistol to fire, the Alpha slammed into him. It took him to the ground and wrapped its hands around his throat. Will felt the pressure increase exponentially and he couldn't breathe. And the pressure started to build in his temples and behind his eyes. And in desperation, Will stuck the Hellcat against the beast's ribcage and started squeezing the trigger. He kept squeezing until the slide locked back. As the pressure against his throat subsided, Will gulped in huge breaths of air. And getting to his feet, the Alpha began staggering towards Sarah. Will knew in an instant that it intended to kill her as its last act of defiance and hatred. Sarah was lying twenty yards away, close to the edge of the cliff. As the creature approached her, Will forced himself to his feet and started running that way. His eyes locked on Sarah, and he saw the terror in her eyes. And then he saw the expression change when she realized what Will was doing. No, she screamed, reaching out a hand toward him. Will drove into the side of the Alpha like a linebacker tackling a quarterback. He pushed with all the strength that he had left in him, forcing the Alpha closer to the edge of the cliff. The Alpha realized too late what Will was doing. There was nothing he could do to prevent itself from going over the edge. However, it had no intention of going alone. And with a roar of pure evil, it sank its teeth into Will's left shoulder and dragged him over the edge as it fell. He could hear Sarah's anguished scream as he fell. And time seemed to slow to a crawl as he saw the jagged rocks more than 250 feet below. Survive this, asshole, Will screamed into the Alpha's ear. With the last of his strength, Will grabbed the knife from his belt and drove it into the side of the cliff. The sudden stop nearly tore his arm from its socket and he felt a searing pain as the weight of the Alpha tore it free. As it fell, Will could see chunks of his flesh stuck in the beast's teeth. Will watched for what felt like an eternity as the Alpha fell, still reaching out to grab him. Defiant till the bitter end, the beast impacted on the jagged boulders below. The force of the impact tore the beast apart, sending body parts, blood, and gore flying in every direction. The Alpha was finally dead. Will clung to the handle of the knife with everything he had left. He could feel his grip beginning to slip when he heard voices above him. 
Seconds later, Mika and Jason rappelled down the cliff face and grabbed him before he could fall. Attaching a line around Will's torso and securing it, Mika gave a thumbs up. Will felt the line begin pulling him up, dragging him back onto solid ground. They lay him on his back and Doc immediately began working on him. Is it finished? Will asked weakly. Yeah, man, said Doc. They're all dead. Hoka, hey, he replied and slipped into unconsciousness. Chapter 22 The Blessing Way Monkan Tonka, great mystery, teach me how to trust my heart, my mind, my intuition, my inner knowing, the senses of my body, the blessings of my spirit. Teach me to trust these things so that I may enter my sacred space and love beyond my fear, and thus walk in balance with the passing of each glorious sun. Lakota Prayer Three days had passed since the final battle with the Olonga Daglala. They had all returned to Grandfather's house to heal and mourn their dead. Joseph fell in the battle by the river, David, Alyssa, and Thomas died in the cave below Hahatanka. They had buried their dead on Grandfather's property. At least, they buried what they could find. Joseph had been torn apart and partially eaten by the Olonga Daglala. The spot they picked for burial overlooked the valley below. The rhythmic beat of the drums and the melodic chanting reverberated down the Niangua River Valley and carried away on the wind. The azure sky was clear and cloudless, and the air was cold and crisp, hovering just above freezing. Jason and Will manned the fire for the Anippi and kept the stones hot. It had been three hours since it had begun, and they were starting to grow concerned. While most of the others still wore bandages from their wounds, Will was completely healed. Grandfather said it was the magic of the Hatamataneo that healed him. Now Will hoped that the magic would work again. When the flap of the lodge opened, a rush of steam flooded out into the cold air. And through the mist, a figure emerged and stepped into the light. It was Sarah. Her wounds had healed, and she held her head high. Glancing around and meeting the gaze of all who were there, she held her arms up to the sky and smiled. Anankasan, she said in a joyful tone. Will smiled and went to her. Wrapping her in a thick blanket, he couldn't help but smile as he looked into her eyes. There was a moment of electricity between them and it touched them both to the core. And before he could say anything, Sarah leaned in and kissed him. It was an incredible kiss, full of passion and feeling, and they both felt it on the levels far deeper than merely physical. Destiny had spoken. Returning to the house, they found Grandfather was preparing a large meal for them all. Doc was sitting by the kitchen counter sipping coffee and listening to Grandfather's stories. Sarah went into her room to take a shower and change clothes. And when she emerged, Will was waiting for her with a mug of coffee. She accepted it with a smile and sat on the couch motioning for Will to sit beside her. After a big meal of venison, steaks, and potatoes, and carrots, and fry bread, they all sat back to finally relax. No one spoke for a long moment. They were all content to just let the tension of the last week float away. And after a while, they began to talk amongst themselves, and quiet conversations and private jokes were passed. They all felt like they were in the sun after a long, dark journey. The evil of the Alunga Daglala was gone. I want to say how proud I am of you all, said Grandfather. Not many people ever faced true evil in their lifetime. Not only did you face it, but you defeated it and saved countless lives. There were a few nods and a few smiles, but no one interrupted the man that they all called Grandfather now. Through the hell that they had all faced, they were now family despite being from many different tribes. I wish I could say that their evil was gone from this world forever, said Grandfather, 
But that would be a lie. There are others in the hidden places of the world, and we must be ready should they come back to the world of men. That brought a few dark glances and nods, and everyone understood that the victory here was not a total victory. There would be more, and they would fight them together. Doc nodded at Will and motioned for him to speak with him privately. Will smiled at Sarah and slipped away from the couch. What's going on? asked Will. I'm glad this is all over, said Doc, but I really need to get my butt home. I need to get back to my family. I completely understand, said Will. I'll grab my coat and drive you back to your Jeep. Doc took a few minutes to say his goodbyes to everyone. Grandfather gave him a thermos of coffee and a bag of deer jerky for the trip. As he was heading for the door, Mika caught up with him. Hey, Doc, he said, hang on. Doc turned and saw Mika holding a small box in his hand. This is for you, he said. Really? asked Doc. Thank you. Well, open it, said Mika. Doc opened the small box and found a leather thong necklace with four large black claws on it. What is this? asked Doc. It's from your kill, said Mika. You're one of us now. You've earned a place among the Hatamataneo. Well, thank you, said Doc. That means a lot to me. The next time we meet, said Mika, we'll teach you the secret handshake. Well, that's a deal, said Doc, chuckling. Take care of yourself, Doc, said Mika. Will do, answered Doc. You too. Doc headed out to Will's charger and climbed in the back seat. Sarah got in the passenger side while Will kept the engine running while it warmed up. You ready? asked Will. Yeah, said Doc, but I'm going to miss you guys. We'll miss you too, Doc, said Sarah with a smile. You take care of this big idiot, said Doc, pointing at Will. Oh, I intend to, she replied. Do you know what the worst part of this entire thing is? asked Doc. What's that? asked Will. No one would believe me if I told them the story, he said, shaking his head. They'd lock me up and think I'm crazy. Probably, agreed Will. So I better just tell my wife I helped you hunt down a rogue bear or something, said Doc. That might not be a bad idea, said Will, laughing. So what's next for you, Doc? asked Will. Well, I think I'll call my buddy the pilot to pick me up in Springfield, said Doc. And I have another friend that lives in Springfield, and I think I'll pay him a visit before my plane gets there. Is it anyone I know? asked Will. I don't think so, replied Doc. His name is Wiley Grant. He works for the Nathaniel County Sheriff's Office. I met him a few years back at a training class. Well, I've never heard of him, said Will. Whatever else happens, said Doc, I know one thing for certain. What's that? asked Sarah. I hope to God that I never see one of those damn dog men again, he said. You never know, Will replied. You never know. Once in a lifetime is enough for me, said Doc. I have the feeling that we haven't seen the last of them, said Sarah. Well, call me if you do, said Doc. I won't let you fight alone. Never doubted that for a second, said Will, hugging his friend. You are listening to Apex Predator, Wolf Moon. Written by D.A. Roberts. Read to you by Cameron Buckner. Print copyright by Douglas Roberts. Audio production copyright by Cameron Buckner. Reproduction of this audio in any way is prohibited by U.S. copyright laws without written approval.